So expense management, we're talking about shift. Has anyone read shift at all? Okay. If you haven't, six people into the waiting room. Uh, you. Yeah. How do I make sure that people can just admit without me having to? Uh, have to X out of it and then you have to do that. Go back to the Don't do that. Just let me in and set me a second. You just asked me to do something. I don't know how to do. Let me. <laughs> see. All right. I'm admit you. All right. At the bottom. All right. More. Gotcha. You want to Erica co-host of this meeting? Yes. Okay. What's going on, sir? Thank you for joining us. All right. Can I just exit? Can I just press X? All right. If you haven't discovered by now, Mike Bailey is still learning how to use a computer. <laughs> Okay, gotcha. Nope. nope, okay. So thank you so much for joining us today. We are continuing the shift series and today's topic is gonna be um, expense management. Now, if you haven't read shift in its entirety, I highly recommend that you do. Um, there has definitely been uh, quite a bit of turbulence in this market. So it will certainly give you strategies and techniques that you can use as things start to change or continue to change rather, right? Because we've seen a lot since, I mean, if you just look at the series of events that we've experienced since March of 2020 until today, you just keep seeing like a number of things continuing to affect whether it be the amount of inventory that's in the market, whether it's um, how we're working to get our buyers under contract, whether it's interest rates continuing to rise, like you will get a lot of methodology out of that book. So this is just one part of it. So it starts out with um, perspective. So before we jump into the content, I want to read something to you, okay? Now, the perspective that you want to have is this. So imagine yourself walking across a field on a bright, sunny day. Birds are chirping, it feels good outside. Suddenly, the two or three dark clouds that you noticed off in the distance are looming right overhead and a violent storm erupts. You thought the umbrella you were carrying could withstand anything but a strong gust of wind turns it inside out and whips it from your grasp. In a matter of moments, you are cold, wet, and can barely see your hand in front of your face. What do you do? The only thing you can do is to run for cover, seek shelter from the elements, right? Can we all agree? Okay, so protect your margin. In a shifted market, you may feel like a storm has erupted over your head. On the one side, sellers and buyers are taking up more of your time. On the other, your listings are sitting and your closings are becoming more difficult, meaning you are working more or less money. Suddenly, your umbrella, the systems and strategies you use successfully, and that gave you confidence is no match for what you are facing. But if you protect your margin, you will give yourself time to develop new strategies for a shifted real estate market. Now, some of you who haven't met me might be wondering like, all right, Mike, well, who are you? And how are you able to talk on this topic? So um, I got my real estate license back in 2014 and I've been with Keller Williams ever since, right? So I started out at Keller Williams in Ellicott City um, and I started out as an independent agent, dual career, right? 
And I was working at night trying to figure out, you know, what I was going to do and how to make real estate into like a full-time career. And I joined a uh, expansion team um, that is across the country, learned a lot of information, great strategies, met great people. Then I became a solo agent. And, and after being a solo agent, I decided that, you know what, this isn't any fun by yourself. Um, so I started to build a team. So now I have a partnership. Not only do I have a real estate team, one of the top producers in the market center, I also, um, and I'm an investor. We flip properties throughout Baltimore. Um, we help investors from Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Prince George's County, Washington, D.C. So I'm in three markets. Um, and the reason why I say all of that is because in order to grow in each of those phases, I had to really, really, really dial down on expense management, right? Especially when you're growing a team, because some of you may be thinking that that's something that you're going to want to do, right? You may have a, you may be, you may continue to be a solo agent in higher support roles where you have independent contractors working for you, you know, whether it be like your photographer, your marketer, your PR person, people like that. But each phase of your real estate career, you're going to have to really dig into expenses. And especially when you're doing something like building a team because other people's incomes are dependent on the decisions that you make, right? So it can be a little scary, but if you take it seriously and kind of really dig into the information, you will weather the storm, right? Because the name of the game is live to fight another day. And that's what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. It's like staying in the game is imperative. You have agents out here that aren't having any closings. I've talked to agents that have not had closings this quarter, right? because they may have chosen to work predominantly with buyers and had not flexed that listing muscle. So these are some people that may have to re-strategize and certainly should be looking at their expenses because gas is not cheap right now, right? <laughs> so you're driving around, take look, taking a D-buyer out to look for homes, that may not be cost effective, right? You need to be focusing on like your a buyers and you know getting them under contract and really doing a lot of due diligence that's just one example right of you know just expense management it's not in here but i also want to talk about real life so if you have questions after i get through parts of the content i want to give you the opportunity to at well maybe at the end right just real life examples where you see like okay mike i'm having challenges here in this space and i want to talk about that is that all right all right. So the main ideas. So one is the perspective on expense management. Two, measure your market. Know the market that you're going into. Size your business. Cutting the fat. Make the most of what you have, right? <clears throat> I love the bold law when it says don't compare your insides to other people's outsides, right? You have no idea what's going on. You may be looking at somebody that's the big bad wolf and you do not know whether they, their business is actually profitable or not, right? So focus on becoming a better version of yourself. If you become better today than you were yesterday, then you are on the right track. Can we all agree? All right. The bottom line and then my action plan. Um, I am not an advocate of being uh, the uh, professional student, right? Get the information, you take real notes, you take pictures of the slides, and then we don't use it, right? I want you to take this information and even if you only take one thing from today, put a 24 hour action plan in place. It's like, okay, what have I taken from today that I can actually do immediately? So you may have your 24 hour action plan, you have your one week action plan, your 30 day action plan and your six month action plan and so forth and so on, right? So those are the ways that you should be thinking about, not just in this training, but any training that you intend how do you get off the blocks and do something within 24 hours? What's something we want to chunk it down and do small activities because the small activities are lead to the bigger activities. Make sense? All right. So the perspective on expense management is to protect your margin. Now, when the market shifts, your margin becomes your biggest issue. Protecting your margin equals saving your business, right? 
because if we don't protect our margins, so when I, when I talk about margins, what are we talking about? Your profit, right? If our expenses are too high, what happens to the margins? They slim, slim down, right? Right. If you're working with investors, you'll hear them. You'll hear them talk about margins all the time. Margins may have sh shrunk right now because you're out in the market. How does that show up real time? You're out in the market. All of a sudden, the same investment property that might have been sixty-five thousand dollars now all of a sudden everybody's bidding up because inventory is low and now people are paying ninety-five thousand dollars. I don't know how they're making that work because also we have the cost of supplies going up, right? Because we got shortages and things coming in and coming in late. So, you know, that, that's important too, right? You, so, so you want to make sure that you're protecting your margin in your business. If you're, if you're paying for leads, you know, the cost of leads may be going up. Um, if you're driving around working with buyers, the cost of gas is going up. Right, it used to cost you sixty dollars to fill up your tank. Now it's ninety-four dollars to fill up your tank. These are all affecting your margins, right? So we want to take all of those things into consideration. And it's time to cut back on the expenses. Gary Keller says, unless it is nailed down, it goes. So nothing should be a non-negotiable. Anytime that you're looking at your expenses, you want to look at it. And with unbiased, not, not in a, oh, I love this little doohickey. You want to hold it accountable. Is it bringing you revenue? Like, is it serving you well? And you will find that there are, is opportunity to, to cut certain things. How many of you have had cable or some sort of service, Netflix, Hulu, something? You don't even watch it, right? You go back through your bank statement, and you're like, well, what is this Planet Fitness charging me $10 a month, right? When's the last time you've actually been to the gym, right? Either you, you need to decide whether you're going, you're going to put an action plan in place, and you're going to actually use this service, or you're going to cut it off, right? Who will be affected? Can I really thrive in a down market? No and yes. In the short term, everyone in an affected market will feel the downturn equally. But cutting expenses fast, anyone can thrive in the long term. So it's important to really get in tune with your expenses so that way you can decide and on what you need to cut, right? So what would that look like? How many of you have actually taken your bank statements and reviewed the last 90 days? Anybody in here done that? Okay, what, what, what are some of the things that you may have discovered when you did that? <laughs> Subscriptions, exactly. So many of us may have looked at our last 90 days and saw all these subscriptions because even in real estate, everybody's trying to get you on something 30 days, right? It's like, okay, you're only bringing in certain, a certain um, amount of revenue at a time, right? We always hope to grow, and yet we kind of have an average idea of like, okay, what is our typical revenue that's coming in each month? And each time you sign up for a subscription, it chips away at that, right? You know, you got $9.99 here, and we sign up for it real easily because it's $9.99 for this. You still sign up for your free trial, and then... You know, in 30 days, 30 days, you forgot that you forgot to cancel it. And then the next thing that's you're on, on is hitting your account, right? So just as a strategy, I recommend putting a lot of your expenses, if you're in the position to do it, put it on the credit card, right? Not coming out of your operating expenses where your cash is going at. So that way you have a lot of those things on a credit card. So that way, hey, if you got to cancel it, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to do. Right. So you can kind of pull that statement, review what you're using, what's not, and, and shut things down. Right. And some people I've definitely gone through like bigger agents. They even have like a policy like ever, you know, every quarter or something like they just cancel everything on the credit card, like shut it down just to make sure because different hands may be using it and they'll just shut it all down and then they'll allow those accounts to be put back in as far as subscriptions, right? So these are just some strategies that you wanna do. So can you really thrive in a down market? No and yes, right? In the short term, everyone in the affected market will 
feel the downturn equally. So no matter the size of your business, we're all going to feel it, right? Just like gas. Everybody, well, unless you have a Tesla, shame on them, right? <laughs> but in, the, in this market, we're all feeling it. You know, buyers and sellers, we're all feeling the inventory shortage in some way, shape, or form, right? Um, so we all feel it immediately. So it talks about getting your money in shape. Phenomenal opportunities exist, but you need to be fighting fit if you want to take advantage of them. So you wanna follow a few steps. One, you measure your market. Two, you size your business. Three, you cut the fat. And four, you make the most of what you have. All right, so I'm gonna just give you a, a second to, uh, to jot those things down. So when we're referring to measuring your market, your business is an economic entity within a greater business environment. You must be well aware of the trends that are happening in your market. Follow the pendulum swing. Like a pendulum on a clock that swings back and forth, the market shifts from buyers to sellers and back again because it may take five or six months for the pendulum to swing between one market and the next, you may be lulled into a false sense of security, thinking you have plenty of time to adjust. But beware, the pendulum will pick up speed as it moves and can swing from one market to the next very quickly. So back in 2018, people were living their best life. It was easy. I mean, everybody and their mama was getting their real estate license because it was just so easy to sell a house, right? And we're still seeing the residual effects of that because people got excited. You know, it was like, all right, boom. And then, uh, then right up until first quarter of like 2020, we saw a shift, right? A shift in just how things were how we had to approach things. All of a sudden, COVID, a lot of us didn't even know if we were gonna be still be in business, right? I remember being in my living room going, oh, I don't have a plan B. It's like people not gonna buy houses, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And thank God I'm a part of a, a brokerage like this because it was just more of a, a rally of like, okay guys, we're not gonna scramble, we're not gonna, even though it looks different, this is still a shift, right? It's a, it's, it's a, a shift usually happens when there's a change in how we're doing business. The market might be interest rates. It may be, you know, going from a seller's market to a buyer's market. In that instance, in 2020, it was COVID because it was like, okay, what are we going to do to bounce back, right? And we dug, dug deep into shift strategies. So again, reshift. So be carefully tracking your MLS statistics. So for those of you who don't know, who may be new, that's Bright. That's the Bright MLS. That's the system that we use to look up property, um, as well as your own numbers. You will be better able to predict a coming downturn and make the timely cuts that can mean the difference between surviving and thriving or not. If any one of the following numbers are shifting, it is a clear signal that your market is transitioning and cuts will likely need to be made in order to protect your margin. So one, more inventory. Use your local MLS to track inventory every two weeks to see if inventory is increasing. Go back at least two months to get a long-term perspective. So you can use the multiple listing service, right MLS. You can also use a tool called Smart Charts. It, tell, it, it will help you see how many months of inventory are on the market. Right, because that's important to know. If there, if you are looking to get into a certain area or do business in a certain area, and there's only three houses on the market, that also will help you set proper expectations if you're working with a buyer that's looking to go and live in that neighborhood. If you're looking, and it, it will help you decide, okay, what kind of strategy am I going to use? Well, if there's only three houses on the market and none of them are mine and I have a buyer that's looking 
to purchase in that neighborhood, what strategy am I going to do? Am I going to door knock? Right? Am I going, you know, am I, am I going to send mailers? These are all a part of my expense management. What tactic am I going to do in order to secure this business while also keeping my margin in intact? In right? Because maybe I'm at a fixed expense and like, hey, maybe I, there are some things that other people are doing that I'm just not in a position to do at this moment. So you know what? I'm going to use my energy. I'm going to hit the pavement. I'm going to walk around and I'm going to knock on the door or I'm going to print out a whole bunch of letters and I'm going to make sure that they get to all the residents, letting them know that I have a qualified buyer that's pre-approved, ready to go. Who do you have? Who, who, who do I need to know in this neighborhood that would love to sell their home? Right. So you have to think outside the box. If there is an inventory, you need to find ways to create. Increase days on market. Use your multiple listing service to track days on market for at least the last two months to get a long term perspective. Days on market are is how long is the property sitting on the market? You know, how long has it been active? We're used to sometimes the properties are going to sell since it's coming soon, right? They don't already three, five offers, sight unseen, over asking price. People that are from the area, they already know it's probably four bedrooms, two and a half bathrooms, it can't be that bad. Sure, $50,000 over this. I want it, right? But if you start to see, okay, Hmm. Because I remember once upon a time, if anybody has been in the business long enough, it's like, okay, it wasn't a thing to see a house on the market for 20, 30 days, right? I own a house, you know, the, the property would be on the market. You'd be advertising, marketing, do your open houses, and that home would be on the market for, a, a, you know, up to 30 days. And then you'd expect it to get a contract. Now, if people... Uh, the house is on, uh, on the market for three days. They're wondering what's wrong with it. What's wrong with it? You know, the seller's calling, hey, you know, you get an offer yet? I don't, I don't understand. You told me the market was too hot. Why, why hasn't it sold? I, I haven't even, I, I got all these, I already spent the money before I got it. So you want to look at that. And, and the reason why that's important, the reason why that's important is knowing the average days on market. Know that, especially when you're working with a seller, you should know that. In your presentation, you, be, you should be having a discussion about that. I have taken over several listings, not because the agent was did a bad job. It's because they never had a conversation with the seller about the average days on market. And literally, they fired the last agent or two, maybe a week before it was should have predicted an offer should have come, come in. And they just didn't communicate that. So they week three, sellers complaining, talking about, you told me you were going to sell my house in two weeks. That's what you promised because you did some sort of agreement um, like that. And then it didn't sell in two weeks. And then here I come and saying, well, Mr. Seller, the average days on market in your community are 34 days uh, based on the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, comparable size, square footage. You, we shouldn't expect anything about 35 days. And they go, oh, really? Yeah. They're like, well, because they're going by what so-and-so said and what they think is going to happen. So that's important information to communicate. So you can look that up in, in the Bright system. Everybody following me so far? Another indicator, fewer pendings. Use your local MLS to compare pendings now with pendings at the same time last year to see if they are flat or have decreased. A smaller board, check with your board to see if the number of realtors on your board has dropped. So when we're talking about, a lot of us are with GBBR, right? According to the National Association of Realtors, like we're at a couple million like real estate agents. Um, like I thought, I think it was like 1.4, don't quote me on that. But there, are, we are like at the all time high of real estate agents being in the business, right? But there's obviously not enough properties being sold to sustain all that. So what the top agents are kind of waiting for is like a lot of them to go away, right? <laughs> We're just kind of like waiting for, because in a shifted market, you find it, it, it separates the weak from the strong, right? Those who have not set themselves up properly and set a solid foundation, will eventually have to figure out what they're gonna do. 
right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that looks like going to find, going, going, going back to a full-time job, right? Or picking up more hours because this just isn't working out. So I want, we, we all want to stay in the game and I wanna see all of you stay in the game, stay in this business. So I want you to continue to use these strategies. Lower production and or volume. Follow your closed transactions on a month by month basis. Fewer leads. The sound of your phone not ringing should be a wake up call for you. Now listen, if the sound of your phone not ringing is the normal thing for you, we already have an issue. You need to be lead generating in some, some way, shape or form. People will say, I don't like talking on the phone. I like meeting people. I say, well, I get it. But in my opinion, it all ends up going back to the phone. Because even when you meet and greet these people, you talk to them, you meet them at these functions, at some point in time, you wanna meet these people at one-on-one -on -one and have discussions. And at some point, you need to pick up the phone and say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, we met at the so-and-so caucus. We're gonna go you know, have coffee and talk about what your real estate goals are, right? So it all, it all at some point in time, it all comes back to the phone. So you wanna make sure that um, you're tracking your leads. If you're having, if you're paying for leads, right, from some of these services, you want to be, you want to be holding those that those dollars accountable. If you're paying five hundred thousand, some people have bigger budgets. They're paying ten thousand dollars a month for leads, or you have a budget for mailings. You want to be holding that those dollars accountable and saying, okay, I'm spending three thousand dollars a month. I'm spending five hundred dollars a month. I don't care if it's two hundred dollars a month. What is the return on your investment? You should, if you're looking at, okay, you've been paying $200 for leads over the course of six months, how many leads have you generated from that? Maybe you're not spending enough, right? Because that could be an issue as well. Because how much do I actually need to spend to play in this, in, to play in this space? Talk to other real estate professionals that may be doing similar tactics as well. You're like, okay, well, how much, how much are you spending on this service? Because I know you're using it too. And what kind of return are you getting on it? Because you might be spending $250 and the sweet spot may be $500 or $1,000. It's, you want to always look at your metrics. Follow me so far? All right. So getting the most out of this is also depending. I know that we, 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 we got into this a little bit. I hope you're still awake, right? The getting the most out of this is deciding what kind of student you're going to be. So you're either going to be the prisoner, right? The prisoner has to be here, you know, but they don't really want to be. They're, they're not engaging. They, they spend class time catching up on their emails. So if you're on your emails right now, I'm talking to you, <laughs> right? Um, you, you know, escapes by spending time in the hall on their phone, pulls on to limiting beliefs, multitasks on their computer by working on a side project, picks fights with trainer. Anybody gonna fight me? Right? <laughs> I had the Will Smith up in here. So you know. the, um, <laughs> the vacation is a day in training is better than a day on the job, right? So you're just here to have fun. Spend as much time chatting it as listening. They are here to have fun, distract the class from others, returns late from break and lunch, not purposeful in their learning goals and spends the day on their smartphone. So this is just, I don't think that's, that, that that's anybody here, right? Because I believe that we're all the explorer. The explorer is excited and curious about new knowledge, skills and tools they will discover in this class. They listen attentively, then participate fully in discussions and exercises. They ask meaningful questions and contribute compelling ahas. Arrives at class on time, which you all which you all did. Great job. Adopts a posture of acceptance, takes notes in their manual for future references, respects the different learning styles and opinions of others. Is that, so we all have a classroom of explorers, right? We won't even have to go through that. So we talked about measuring, measuring the pendulum, watching, um, measuring the market and following the pendulum swing. So for those of you who didn't get to write it down, these are the six market indicators, indicators that you wanna carefully look out for. The inventory, increased days on market, fewer pennings, a smaller board, lower production and our volume and fewer leads. 
So what activities are you doing? What kind of return are you getting from that? So how did you know that it was time to make cuts? So Bruce Hardy from Spokane, Washington knew to the week when his market has shifted during the last major national market shift. I track every call that comes into my office. So I knew that our market has shifted in the week of May, 2006. The reason I knew that is I went from as many as 800 buyer calls per week on my IVR system down to 233, right? So this is what we're talking about by keeping your finger on the pulse of the market. When you're constantly in a, in a place of monitoring the systems that you're using, and you're thinking like, okay, well, I usually have 20 conversations a day on a five-day week, 100 conversations a week, and I usually set one or two appointments. Hmm, no appointments this week, no appointments next week. Oh, there's a problem, right? We start to see like, oh, uh, you know, we need to start making some adjustments. I, he, this gentleman, he said, he, he said, I went from as many as 800 buyer calls per week to 233. 800 calls sounds a whole lot different than 233. So that's a time where you, where you need to start um, paying attention. So watch your pipeline. Keep your pipeline first and foremost in mind. So when we talk about your pipeline, what are we talking about? Your pipeline is the clients that you're working with, whether it be buyers or sellers. Do you have enough buyers? And you can, you can um, there, there's, um, there are strategies, whether um, it's in the MREA, um, in shift, and you can also connect with, you know, the coaches at our market center, like Alana, to talk about how many closings do you need to have in order to keep, uh, keep up with your goals, right? How many, how many A buyers or A sellers do you need or a combination of both that you need in order to make X amount of dollars per month? Because you know, it takes a little bit of time for closings. Okay. I need to take, I need to factor in how many clients I have. have. I, I need to also take into consideration potential fallout because everybody's not going to, going to close. For anybody who just cried a little bit, that's okay, right? Everybody, unfortunately, every one of your clients is not going to close, right? So we need to prepare for that. Something's going to happen, and it's just not going to work out. Somebody's going to go buy a car right in the middle of the transaction. It's going to happen. They're going to mess it up. They're going to quit their job, or they lose their job, right? They don't, they don't tell you, they're like, you know what, if I just, if I just be quiet, <laughs> right. sit still and sign these papers, then nobody's going to say anything. Until Hold on, accept the offer, then change their mind because they don't, somebody, grandmother, sister, aunt told them that they didn't like the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So there's going to be a change and you want to budget for that. Don't have your bills counting on every last one of these buyers, right? Don't, don't do, or, or, or one of these sellers, because you're going, you're going to be kind of messed up in the game, right? All right, so when we're looking at your pipeline, I want you to, I want you to be set up for success. So you should be looking at your buyers and sellers. One, you should be using a CRM if you're not using it, which is your client uh, referral uh, management system. I probably botched that, but it's, so you may have command, you may be using some other service because if all of your contacts are in your phone, that's a problem, right? That's not your database. Your database is a living, breathing system to keep track of your, your people, right? And tells you what to do, to call them, to email them, to send them a letter, like all of those things. They should be labeled as A, ready to go, ready, rock and roll. They got pre-approval. All you got to do is find them a house. They got B, they have maybe have one thing that they got to, that they have to do is like, hey, I'm ready. I'm out of town. I'll be back in, you know, in three weeks, and then I'm ready to rock and roll. See, I got a credit problem. I gotta take care of that. You know, I gotta wait till my my my, you know, till the school year ends, so that way we can move. That's a C, right? Your focus needs to be on your A people, and then 
systematically moving them up. Because they may be C, and then they'll change to a B, and they'll change to an A. You want to keep those people in mind. That's how you keep your pipeline full. If you only have three clients right now, and you do that assessment, you find out that they're all C, guess what? You got some more work to do. You got some more conversations that you need to have, some open houses, some door knocking, some mails to send out because your pipeline is low, right? And what you don't want to do is get caught up on the roller coaster when you're working with those clients and then you <sighs> get them to the closing table and then you got to turn the wheel all over again because now you have nothing in your pipeline. You got to do all this work to find those people. So I want to keep you out of that. So we want to always be monitoring our pipeline. Who do we have? Put it in several places. I keep it on a spreadsheet so I can look at it from my phone. I, I put it on a whiteboard so that way I'm physically, because Miss Judy might have said, hey, I have something to do. And you, and you might forget about that, right? You want to be using your database because Miss Judy might just be waiting for you to call. Don't you, have, don't you ever get one of those clients who are like, I didn't know what to do. I just, you didn't call me, so I've been sitting here waiting. Right, sale right there. So track your income for the next 60 days. Calculate how many closings you have and your projected income from those closings. Based on your commissions, I, I know, even though we're not good at math, everybody knows how to calculate their commission. That's one thing we seem to do well. So a lot of people don't keep their eye on the ball until they go to the bank and realize their checking account is empty. So they better get to work. But I constantly watch that what is 30 or 60 days ahead of me for closed income, right? So we want to be looking at those pipelines that pipeline of clients that we have, looking at projected income, looking at our expenses, and then also keeping it full, right? We can't get caught up in just servicing the client and not bringing new people into the pipeline because it will dry out. Any questions about that? So these are some of the same questions. How many clothes are in the pipeline for the next two months? What is your projected income from your closed transactions? And what will be your average monthly income based on your 60-day projection? So you want to know if you're in the red or in the black, right? And if it's looking like you're going to be in the, in the red, we need to make some adjustments now. Size your business. It is time to take a cold, hard look at your financial situation. Once you have a clear picture of your financial situation, it will be easy to see what adjustments you should make. Um, look at two broad categories, um, your personal expenses and your business expenses. So your lifestyle. As a real estate agent, you work in a market-based, commission-driven industry. When the market goes down, you will make less money in the short term. You don't say Hmm. The lifestyle you have been financing may need some adjustments. This is probably not the year to plan extensive vacations, redecorate your home, or take on new car payments. Adjust your lifestyle costs to, to just below your projected income. That way, you can be pleasantly surprised if you have extra. An easy way to get an instant snapshot of where you are truly spending money is through online banking. Remember I talked about that? Many banks feature a spending report as part of their online services, which automatically classifies your expenses into different categories, allowing you to see at a glance where your money is really going. Because as agents, we like to be flashy. We got to have a new car. I need this Benz because it's gonna make me, it's gonna make me look good. Because when I pull up, you know, I gotta look like money so that they do business. That, that's not true. That, that's, that's not true. That's, that's what you're telling yourself. And, and you're going to be going back to the job, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to finance that when the market shifts. And what also, what also having your expenses super, super high, it prevents you from growing the business, right? Because especially when you're growing a team, that may be education or things that you need to give to your people in your team you know, to help them grow, training, education that you need in order to get to the next level that you can't when, you're, when your expenses are super, super high. 
So um, adjust your lifestyle costs to just below your projected income, as, as we've already said. So if you are, if you have a significant other, or if you're married, right? You got a little boo-boo, right? <clears throat> I, I found that keeping this to yourself is not helpful, right? Like I, I had to learn the hard way because you're in this space around great people who are giving you all this information and talking about looking at your last 90 days of bank statements and protecting the margin and, and doing all that stuff. And then you go home and you're significant other than bought furniture, right? It doesn't help. So it, I would suggest <clears throat> that if you, if, based on your lifestyle, this needs to be a family conversation, right? Because the business is what's gonna provide the opportunities for you to live the life that you're looking to, to, to have, right? Sometimes it sucks, babe. Yeah, I already know it's coming. I'm like, look, 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 I'm not saying no. I'm not saying no. I'm saying not right now. I'm just saying that. I'm just saying not today. I know you want to go to Martha's Vineyard. I, I, I said, yeah. We just, just the market is not me, right? <laughs> it's not me, but the market is telling me that we have to make some adjustments. So don't, don't blame me. We're blaming the market, right? So I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the bad guy. So we just have to make adjustments for the long term. That new car that you deserve, right? You may want to wait, right? If you haven't, and some people that I would suggest that you connect with that will help you make these decisions. Because if you're like me, you don't know everything. Having a bookkeeper, talking to your financial advisor connecting with your CPA, they will help you make strategic decisions to help you continue to stay in the game, right? So they may say like, hey, you're spending money here, if you category, categorize it as that, you can do it, but we have to do it this way, right? So all those things matter. Examine your personal expenses, how much are you spending and which categories are costing you the most? If you like me, Take out. All of a sudden, you're looking at that expenses and you're like, oh man, I spent $400 this week on Grubhub and lunches. Because it's, it's real easy to rack up those bills as real estate agents because you're entertaining folks. It's like you done had a you done had a working lunch over here, they done got a couple of drinks on your tab. Then it's like, okay, then you turned around, you were working late, and you get another, then it's like, oh, I don't have time to cook, I'm gonna bring some food home. You keep doing that, and the next thing you know, you're looking at like five hundred thousand dollars on a credit card. Just boom, you know, because we love to go to restaurants and, and bars and, and Starbucks and just and just woo, because we just doing it. I'm money, you know, just money ain't a thing, right? I deserve so it. I bars. deserve it. Oh, I deserve it, right? I deserve it, baby. I deserve. So that will keep us in trouble, right? So we want to make sure that we are looking at our expenses and holding ourselves accountable to our budgets, right? So if you don't have a budget, you need to get one. Because when you go on trainings, especially real estate agents, there's always somebody calling you offering a doohickey that says, okay, try this thing. It'll bring you leads. They'll magically show up at your door. You're going to make lots of money, right? So you want to be want to have a budget for the things that you're going to do. And if you're spending money on certain systems, hold it accountable, look at it for 30, 60, 90 days, assess it. Maybe you need to give it six months before you decide to cancel it, but you should be looking on for a return. So what is the best budget to follow? The one you follow, right? Because you can always adjust it. You may have to do it multiple times, so it's okay. You, but you should have a budget. You know what kind of income you're working with, so it's like, okay, for my lead generation, I need to have a, a budget of X amount of dollars per month. If I'm sending out mailers, X amount of dollars per month. The Market Center offers a lot of things that offset a lot of that, like giving you a CRM and things like that. 
So you need to find out what is already being offered to you from your market center. If you're not tuned in, you need to talk with our folks here so that you can see what you're already paying for, right? Because I see a lot of people making, doing duplicates of things. And you're just not in a position to make that leap to try something different just yet. Pinpoint how much you are spending. Complete the PL statement in the chart accounts from the millionaire real estate agent. So when I talk about when they say PL, that's your profit and loss statement. If you don't know what that is, we need to make an adjustment. You should look at profit and loss statement. Everyone should be doing a profit and loss statement, right? <clears throat> that's how you because you not only do you need to uh, to be monitoring that on a monthly basis basis to make sure that you're making money or losing money, also need it for your taxes. So when I'm talking with a, an agent who's selling a lot of houses, doing it, money, and I ask them what a PL statement is, and they say, what is that? It scares me. So I'm like, you, I, something tells me that you're not paying your taxes, right? Because they leave that responsibility on us as 1099, and we have to pay our own taxes, right? So we want to make sure that we're following that. Size your business, find your margin, tally up both your monthly, personal, and business expenses. Subtract your personal and business expenses from your monthly income. I don't think I need to explain that. We know, we know what that is, right? So subtract your personal and business expenses from your monthly income. We know what we haven't have in doing that. So your personal expenses may look like your rent or your mortgage, your utilities, your cell phone, your health care, your grocery. Don't be running around here without no health care, right? You figure out how to get it. Groceries, insurance. Do you have the right insurances that you need? Um, entertainment. Um, might be athletic. Dining out, travel, wardrobe, setting budgets for all these things. So that way you can continue to run your business. If income is lower than expenses or the margin is tight, you must immediately take two steps because that may happen, right? Make cuts in your expenses, step up your lead generation. Gotta have leads, to have closings, to fill our, fill our pipeline. We're cutting the fat. Take stock and look for results. Keep one question uppermost in your mind. How does the expense help produce a buyer or a seller lead? That's when we're talking about that accountability. Is this serving me well? Is this bringing uh, value to your business, to your lifestyle, to what you're looking to accomplish, right? So we need to hold those things accountable, 30, 60, 90 days. Some systems take six months that you want to monitor. If the answer is, I don't know, or worse, it doesn't, it is an expense that must be cut. Cut it off. You're not watching Hulu, cut it off. Take stock and look for results. Try zero-based budgeting. Cut every expense back to zero. Reallocate funds to your justifiable expenses. That's when I was telling you the example where people put all their expenses on the credit card and then, hey, every so 90 days each quarter, boom, shut it all down and then reallocate those expenses back to, I think I, I, I sometimes you look through your, your expenses, like I found like a peel box I was paying for. I don't even, I don't even use, right? Because you have multiple locations, you're doing business areas, so you may have certain things. It might be something small that be, may be calling, uh, costing you $45 a month. So you just want to check. Um, don't assume that you know. Because some of them are like, I know my expenses. Trust me, print it out, you'll find something. Start cutting snail mail, office space. Those, those, that's easy. Vendor contracts, print advertising, office supplies, certain things you may just find that you just don't need, or you can find a cheaper opportunity. If you're, if you're a realtor, get Office Depot, use your discounts. So there are certain websites that will give you certain discounts. So National Association of Realtors, by being associated with but being associated with the National Association of Realtors, you're, you're due certain discounts, even on healthcare. So you need to look into the money that we're already giving away. Think of two areas where you can make cuts today. Like I talked about that 24 hour action plan. Don't walk out of here, taking pictures of slides, taking notes and don't use it. What can you do today? It might be something as small as 
Let me look into the healthcare that is offered for real estate agents. Let me look into a, you know, I'm going to make that phone call, right? Not look into, it wants to be definitive, right? I'm going to make the call to the Association of Realtors to find out about their healthcare so I can have a consultation. Like that's definitive. Okay, in 24 hours, you did that. In 24 hours, I'm going to cut off my cable, right? Because I don't need it. I'm not even home to watch it. I read books, right? You may have different subscriptions that you may need to cut. The big two, payroll and lead generation. The quickest way to cut expenses is to cut back on payroll. However, your staff is an investment. Before dehiring, try to slim down the payroll. Thank God for our operations manager because when things started looking dicey, I was like, fire everybody. Everybody gotta go. This person, that person, look, we done. I, I don't care. Because, and just like, wait, 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 wait. Certain things, certain people, you might relax because you're not going to have a business if you start cutting everything, right? Because the name of the game is live to, live to play another day, right? The, the, your focus should be saving the business, right? When you see big businesses downsizing, we see it all the time, right? Commercial retail stores. You know, unfortunately, that does lead to people losing jobs and, and, and things like that. But they like, look, we got to protect this house, right? So they sometimes those are there are tough decisions that have to be made in order for the company to survive a, a hard time. And then you can expand later. But you're not even going to give yourself the opportunity to live if you don't make if you don't have the tough conversations and make the tough decisions today. So cut hours, combine positions. Hey, look, anybody that works in co corporate America, you find out real quick that your job description will change if you want to stay here, right? Offer a bonus rather than salary increase. Offer a package. Listen to what your staff wants. The big two payroll, it may not be possible to keep everyone on your team. Top grade your employees, let go of those who do not perform to standard. Look first at part-time staff, new staff members, borderline performers. Payroll and lead generation is shifting market. You, your lead generation should be focused on prospecting and enhanced by marketing. That's important to know. Prospecting-based marketing enhanced. Prospecting, network. What does that mean? People that you met, you should be connecting with them. Hey, Joe. How's the baby? Hey, Sally, you told me that you were going to be doing, growing vegetables. How's that going? You know, you need to be communicating with these people and visiting them and putting them in your database and asking for referrals. Lead generation, you should be having conversations daily. Um, it's recommended by both 20 conversations a day, whether it be by Instagram, social media, sort like Facebook, any of those things. Prospect for sale by owners and expires. Um, hold more open houses. So if you're doing one on a Saturday, bump it up. You should be doing two to four. Yeah, you're gonna sweat a little bit. Saturday, 11 to one, boom, take a break, three to five, bust it out every week. Trust me, you'll see the results. You might do Saturday and Sunday. You don't have a, a listing to do it, find somebody else in the market center you like, with a property in their neighborhood, a few days. It's a whole bunch of agents in this office, door knock around there, and let them know about the open house. Let them know about the property that's for sale. Meet the neighbors. Ask them if they know that's somebody that's looking to sell. Got to be creative. Get involved in the community, community association. Become a board member. Give back. Give people a reason to see you, to communicate with you, because everything isn't just about, hey, you want to sell a house? Hey, you want to sell a house? Hey, you want to buy a house? Like, they want to know that you're a real person. Right. And people who do business with you because they know, like and trust you and they find out, oh, what do you do? Well, I sell real estate, you know, you know, you know, and eventually they say, you know what? I've been meaning to talk to you because I saw you last time we were giving out book bags and I had a question. Um, you know, my sister's thinking about selling her house and she has some questions. That's awesome. Great. I'd love to talk to her. What's her name and number? Uh, I'll reach out to her. Marketing. Market for a direct response. Any marketing that you should, 
that you're putting out there should have a call to action. That's just a word of advice. You know, say after the end of your message, you say, you say for a free consultation, give me a call at 1 800 999. Like it should tell them what to do next, not just receive the information. And it shouldn't be just like, oh, if you think about real estate, just give me a call. No. If you are looking for a, a free analysis on the value of your home, give me a call today at 410 All your messages should have a call to action. Drive customers to speak with you rather than just build your brand. If you're saying stuff on social media, and if you're interested in joining the market center or if you're interested in buying a house, here's my number, call me at 410-555-555. You need to make it easy for people to communicate with you. Follow up on your marketing with personal contact. What not to cut? Not everything must go think long-term. Some people have services that are worth keeping. So don't cut customer service. Don't cut training and coaching. A lot of people will say, well, sorry, go ahead. So it, it, so it depends, right? So if I'm looking for an investment property that we're looking to renovate, back on the market, I may be using some sort of service um, where they're sending postcards and say, hey, have you taken a look at, you know, we buy crappy houses, you know, because sometimes the messages change based on the service. We buy crappy houses. You don't want to uh, deal with it anymore. Give us a call at 410, blah, 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 right? If it's a house that I have on the market that's for sale, we may have just sold, just listed, just um, uh, coming soon postcards that come out there a little fancy. If you or somebody you know that's looking to buy or sell, please give us a call or go to this website here, here, and here. So it depends on what type of, because I'm looking at the client. Who am I looking to attract, right? right? Am I looking for people who are in the middle of an estate that are going through a divorce or somebody that's passed away? Am I looking for that? Fix them up, rent them up type properties? Am I talking about standard listings? Am I looking for buyers? So I just want to be clear on the message and who I'm looking to attract depends on what type of correspondence I send out. Make the most of what you have. I'm probably about to run over a second. Did we have something right behind us? All right. Um, use human energy. Put your creativity and your energy into working both harder and smarter. Do the FaceTime transactions yourself. So <clears throat> you want to get in front of people, right? We want to make sure that we're getting in front of people. Again, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. Get more assistance, not assistance. Work with preferred partners. So these are people that you have a relationship with. We have in-house lenders, we have title companies, but sometimes things get dicey. And when we talk about, um, it's easy when I can go, when, for example, I needed a home inspection for whatever reason, things got dicey. I need a home inspection in 24 hours. Like literally the next day, my deadline was going to end. I went back to my preferred guy, right? Because anybody else, I would have to have at least like three days notice, right? So it, it can, there can be benefit to using the same people because they, they look at you more, more than just a number, right? Because it's like, all right, you know, Sally did one transactions with, with us all year long. You know, I don't need to jump over hoops but this person, you know, doesn't work out, um, you know, I'm sorry. But sometimes you need a favor. Maximize your tools, leverage your yard signs, use your market center services. Again, we should be drawing a big yellow uh, circle around that. Use your market center services. That's why you're here. That's the value of being at the home of top producers. Harness KW technology. Take advantage. We're not using E-Edge anymore. We're using command. So if you don't know what command is, you need to ask the friendly folks here at Keller Williams Legacy if you need to be in it. Career growth initiative. So this is how we talk about, this is how you're tracking. This is, this is a, a, a diagram of the four conversations. You should be having the four conversations with yourself. Listing appointments, listings taken, and that could, listing could be buyers or sellers, right? So how many appointments are you going on? How many of those appointments, appointments that you went on turned into signed agreements? They talk about the wall of value because you want not to get fired, right? Because if people don't see your value, that's when people walk away. Then 
okay, I've taken those agreements. Now, how many of those agreements turn into closings? And then how many of those closings turn into profit, right? Because just because you take five clients and you get down to the, uh, in the other end of the spectrum, all five of those people may not have turned into profit, right? So you might have five and end with three that close. Right, because of fallout, because changing plans. Hey, you know what? I just lost my job. I can't move. And you just want to start to see that trend because then us that will start to tell you your story because X amount of closings equals X amount of profit. Now, it also tells you that, oh, if I want to increase my profit, I need to double, triple, quadruple the amount of appointments that I go on because then the conversion starts to go down, right? So we got, might turn into five, four, three. Now, if I know if I want that three to turn into a six, I have to start with 10 because I need to go on 10 appointments for my conversion to end up with six so I can have six closed because four of them may change their mind or and or fall out or something may adjust. That makes sense? The bottom line, downtrending markets are a huge opportunity to find better ways to run your business. Yes, it's a tough time, but you will be better for it. And you will be better in the long term because you're going to learn some great skills. The degree to which you need to respond will depend on the conditions in your local market. Your success will depend on how well you know and understand the market. Question every assumption you have and every dollar you spend as a result. So when we're talking about the action plan, don't put away this guy without developing a plan to put what you have learned into action. Talk about that. Refer to the action plan on 38, 39. That's not important. We took a lot of notes here, right? So you should know what your 24 hour action plan is gonna be, your one week action plan. If you don't have it, take five minutes, write it down now. Don't leave out of here without knowing what the plan is. Um, and then write down steps you will take to improve your skills, complete it, share it, and commit to it. These are the rest of the classes that is gonna be a part of this series. I encourage you to take them. Um, there will be announcements made on when those classes will be held. I thank each and every one of you for attending today. I hope you got some great value out of today's session. Um, and I'm gonna stick around for a few minutes just in case um, you have any questions. And if you have to go, thank you so much for attending again.